much, um, uh, Alex, for the kind introduction. And uh, uh, my thanks to the uh, Wright Foundation and the uh, Wright family for uh, making it possible to uh, bring us all over here this week for this uh, wonderful series of colloquia that we, the scientists, have really enjoyed. And thanks also to the people of Geneva for making us so uh, uh, welcome and uh, 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 making sure that the week that we've had has, has, has been so much fun for us scientists. Uh, right, the, the theme of this uh, colloquium series uh, uh, is molecular architectures. And uh, the molecular architectures that I'm going to talk about today are all based on these sorts of things, rings. And we'll pass this uh, uh, around. So if you could pass this uh, uh, around and back, we'll get back to it uh, uh, later. Because uh, rings have got a, a really important place in uh, uh, molecular architecture, but you have to have the right sort of rings. Uh, if the rings are, are, are too big, uh, then lots of different things can go in and outside of those rings, and you lose some of the benefits of that molecular uh, shape. If the rings are too small, then nothing will fit inside the rings. And again, you lose some of the benefit of the uh, cyclic uh, uh, shape and topology. But if you choose the right sort of rings, which have got the right size of hole in them and the right sort of chemical structure, then you can bind things, other molecules, selectively with inside the cavities of those rings. And if you choose your uh, uh, rings carefully and you've got the right sort of cyclic structures and they're the right sort of size and shape, then if you're very, very careful and very, very lucky, then strange things can happen. Strange things can happen. No, no, no. No, 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 no. No. But I, I am available for birthdays and bar mitzvahs and, 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 and Christmas. Uh, uh, but really what I'm going to talk to you about is the sorts of uh, surprising things you can do with these rings, the architectures that you can create, and how you can use these sorts of uh, cyclic structures to create uh, molecular-sized machines. So um, really the size of these structures, to give you some sort of idea uh, uh, about that, we're, we're really talking about the smallest we can possibly make a machine. So 50 years ago, a computer uh, would have filled uh, the size of, uh, uh, of this stage. And we know that in the subsequent 50 years, now the uh, uh, computer chips that are found in your uh, uh, iPhones and uh, uh, smart devices, uh, uh, the actual chips can fit on the size of a, a, of a pinhead to have the same calculating power as something that would fit in the machine. But I'm not talking about going in terms of scale down from meters to sort of millimeters. What I'm talking about is going right the way down to the bottom, to things that are a millionth of the size of these sorts of machines, down to the nanoscale, or things that are a millionth of a millimeter uh, uh, wide. And there are uh, high hopes for these sorts of uh, machines. People uh, hope that they're going to create a sort of revolutionary nanotechnology which will allow them to do all sorts of, uh, 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 of amazing things, both in disease and in other sorts of areas. Uh, but there are fears as well. And uh, some people, uh, such as the Prince of Wales in my uh, country, that very eminent scientist, uh, is uh, really concerned that there's going to be self-replicating nanobots that are going to take over the, uh, uh, the planet. So what's the, uh, the truth of these things? What's the science fact and what's the science fiction? Well, uh, in this sort of research area, what we try and do in, in our group and in our field is to uh, uh, follow the advice of um, Alan Kay, who was an American computer scientist who worked for Hewlett-Packard and Apple. And at the times that... Uh, uh, that there were all rumors going around in the 70s of 80s, oh, Apple are going to do this, oh, IBM are going to do that. Alan Kay cut through to the heart of the, uh, the, the essence of the issue of, of how to predict the future by saying the best way to predict the future is, in fact, to invent it. And as scientists, we're able to do that in the field of molecular machines by using 
synthetic chemistry. And chemistry is sort of unique amongst the sciences in that it allows you not only to study uh, how things are in terms of uh, biological machines and biological structures, as we've heard this week and will do tomorrow, but also to create new things, create things that haven't been made before, and to uh, uh, invent new types of systems that can have uh, exciting functions. And that's the uh, uh, field of molecular machines. It's going to be what we choose to invent it to be. But why do we think that it's going to be possible to shrink the concept of a machine down to the molecular level anyway? Well, the answer is that there already is a working nanotechnology out there. It's the one that's used by nature. And this slide actually shows the reason why uh, scientists should be uh, perhaps trying to make uh, uh, molecular-sized machines. And it's because biology, nature, uses molecular machines for everything. So the way that you're able to look at the, the board, the way that your muscles move, the way that energy is harvested from the sun, the way that replication occurs, DNA replication, the way that information is stored in the, uh, the cells, Every single biological process depends fundamentally on molecular machines to control molecular movement. And in contrast, at the start of the 21st century, mankind doesn't use molecular machines or control molecular motion for anything at all. So every pharmaceutical, every drug, every chemical reagent, every catalyst, any, every material in our technological world just depends upon the static or equilibrium properties of the, uh, of the molecules. And biology hasn't evolved over two and a half billion years to use molecular machines for everything for no good reason. And when scientists learn how to actually put molecules together that, uh, and control their movement and allow them to interface with other molecules, then I'm sure it's going to revolutionize uh, our, our complete way of approaching functional molecule uh, and material design. Uh, but the way that we're going to do that is not to shrink down uh, motor cars to the molecular level. We can't do that because, unfortunately, the way that matter behaves at different length scales is just so different. So uh, what we have to do is to try and learn from biological machines, see how, how molecular machines are made in biology, and then use those design principles to actually design our own sort of structures. So, for example, uh, to show this sort of effect of, uh, uh, of scale, um, uh, this uh, nameplate is just going to stay there on the uh, lectern uh, unless I give it some uh, uh, kinetic energy because it's uh, a big object in the big world. But at the molecular level, things aren't stationary. They're constantly moving. And you don't have to give them energy in order to cause them to move, to, to make the components of machines move. They're already moving at the molecular level. What you have to do is to actually uh, uh, control, uh, control that movement, get rid of the random movements that you don't want, and what you're left with is how to uh, actually make machines. And the way that biology do, does that, and the way that we're going to copy it, is to use architectures which restrict the degrees of freedom of the components. So um, if we look at these sorts of structures, we'll see that many of these machines move along tracks or rotate around um, uh, axes. And uh, we're going to make exactly the same sort of architectures uh, 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 with our, uh, uh, for our sort of machines. And in fact, these are the sorts of architectures that we're going to uh, uh, use. This sophisticated uh, molecular model is supposed to describe one of those sort of uh, molecules where uh, each of these uh, red and blue rings is sort of a molecular structure. And these are, uh, can't be uh, broken apart without breaking one of the rings, but they're free to move with respect to each other. And these sorts of molecules are called catenanes, from the Latin catena, meaning chain, because these are a bit like links of a chain. And what you can do with a catenane is perhaps control the motion, the rotation of one of the rings through the other, and maybe use that. Uh, as the basis for a controlled motion in a molecular machine. Uh, the second sort of um, architecture that we're going to meet is where one of those rings is replaced by a linear uh, uh, axle, uh, and uh, the, the ring is able to move along the axle, but it's stopped from coming off from by these bulky stoppers. And this sort of architecture is called a rotaxane, 
from the Latin rota, meaning wheel, and axis, meaning axis. And uh, 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 again, the nice thing about this is that you can control the translational motion. And if you can control translational motion and rotational motion, then that's everything. But how are we going to make these sorts of uh, uh, molecules? It's hard enough to thread the eye of a needle in the big world. How are we going to thread the eye of a needle when the needle's eye is only one nanometer, one millionth of a millimeter across? Well, the answer, again, is to use a, an idea from uh, nature and use this concept of self-assembly. And I wanted to try and um, demonstrate for you uh, sort of how self-assembly works. Uh, uh, and I was, I was trying to think of how to do that. And then today, I went down to uh, the, uh, in the hotel to get the, the newspaper. And you can see that the, the landlady has a, a dog and had got to, the, um, uh, had got to the newspaper before me. Uh, but it got me thinking that, of course, a, a newspaper is a very complicated, it's a very complicated, information-rich structure that requires lots of uh, effort from lots of men and women uh, to put together every day. You need your journalists to uh, write the stories. You need your copy editors to uh, edit them. You need the page designers to lay out the pages. You need them to then be printed uh, and, and distributed. And it's a really complicated way of putting together such a big structure. And I always wondered, wouldn't it be sort of easier if you could take the sort of simple building blocks and get them to sort of self-assemble to uh, actually no, no, no. and get them to self-assemble to build your sort of structure yourself. And that's the sort of things that we try and do in our uh, uh, group, try and get the building blocks, the molecules, to make them uh, uh, to make themselves. Uh, but in fact, we got into this area by uh, chance. We weren't deliberately trying to make these molecules. Some 17 years ago now, we were trying to make molecules that look like this, this sort of ring-shaped uh, uh, structure. Um, which is designed, it's the right size of shape to bind to carbon dioxide. And we wondered whether we could use this to uh, maybe scrub carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. But when we tried to make this molecule by mixing together these commercially available chemicals on the left, we got a surprise because we didn't get this one ring molecule at all. What we actually got were two of these rings interlocked together to form a catenane, this cyclic structure. And it's perhaps easier to see from uh, this structure of how the atoms appear in the crystal. One of these rings is shown in yellow, and the other is shown in light blue. And the actual reason that this forms is that uh, these dotted lines represent hydrogen bonds, which are the same sort of things that hold water together that we heard of uh, uh, Takoso uh, Aida earlier this, uh, uh, earlier this week. And these actually template uh, the formation, stick together the two rings, and uh, cause this threading reaction to occur to form uh, the catenate. And this is a one step, eight molecule condensation, four of these molecules and four of these uh, to form a, a, a catenate. Uh, and it was when it was discovered 17 years ago and still is today, one of the simplest ways of forming these threaded structures that's been discovered. So this was just a, an act of serendipity, a surprising thing that happened in the lab. But surprising things happen all the time. Uh, uh, surprising things happen all the time. And it's not just have something surprising happen that's the important thing. Of course, it's what you recognize that you can do with it. So we discovered this strange way of being, uh, of being able very efficiently to make these interlock rings that can undergo these large motions. We wondered, could we use that to actually control the motion of these systems and actually use it to uh, 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 actually use it as the basis, sort of molecular machines. And so, for uh, what I'm going to try and tell you about today is uh, uh, about how you uh, uh, how you're about going about doing that. So it turns out you can make not just rotaxanes this way, but also uh, not just catenanes this way, but also rotaxanes. So who has the ring that we just passed out? Does someone have that in the audience? Who has the metal? Oh, could you come down and give me a hand, sir? Would you mind? If you don't mind, if you could just come up on the stage round here so you don't 
fall off, it's just come up, and then we'll come around here. Oh, no, no, quick, quick, quick. Dépêche toi. Uh, and so I'm David from FLW. Simon, nice to meet you, Simon. Okay, we're going to try and do some chemistry now. Okay, a, a demonstration. If you hold out your ring uh, like this, that's, that's great, fantastic. So we have the ring, we have the, uh, the thread here, we have two bulky stoppers, one much bulkier than the other, and uh, what we'll try to do is um, uh, 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 form the uh, rotaxane. So I just need to put a bit of catalyst on here. There we go. Right, and if you just drop it, Simon, just drop, drop. Boom, brother. You well done. Well done. Fantastic, Simon. Well done. Big hand for Simon. Well done. And I'm pleased to say it works just as well in the lab. You see 100% yield just as Simon uh, got. So what actually was happening there was that in the thread there was a carbon-carbon double bond. And this catalyst that I added opens and closes this double bond many times, allows the ring to thread on, and you can get these really great yields. So we can really make these sorts of uh, molecules. And it turns out, uh, sorry for all the chemical structures on this slide, but this is just to show that this reaction is actually uh, uh, very structurally tolerant. You can make lots and lots of different types of molecules put in structures using this uh, chemical reaction. Some of them work really well, uh, and some of them involve biological substrates uh, uh, and so on. So it's really possible to make these sort of things. What can we do with them? Well. Uh, to make a molecular machine that exploits these sort of interactions, uh, one way to do that is to have two different binding sites for the ring on the thread. And if we have that, then if you remember I said that all the components of molecules are moving at the molecular uh, level, and so in fact these, uh, the rings actually move between these two sites, but they'll prefer to stay on whichever site is the stickiest uh, for the ring. But because we're chemists, we can do chemistry on this molecule and perhaps change the chemical structure of this binding site, make it uh, chemically different and perhaps not so sticky. And if we do that, then all these Cheerios are going to go to this end and the net position of the ring on the thread will change. And if this is a reversible reaction that we can make go the other way too, then what we have is a mechanical switch that works on the molecular level that's reversible that we can move back and forth. And um, we can use lots and lots of different stimuli, uh, lots of different diff sort of forces to make this switching uh, effect work. We can just change the polarity of the um, environment. So we can move it, it switch, change it between being oily and water-like and use that to bring about changes of the position of the ring on the thread. Or we can, if we design our molecule differently, we can use light or electricity or temperature or uh, binding to various different sorts of anions. All of these things, if you design them properly, you can use to bring about these switching events. So what can you do with that? You can, now we can make the molecules, we can move the parts, but what can they do? Well, it's really just up to the imagination of the scientist, because we can add bits to the, uh, 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 to the ring and to part of the, the thread-like structure, and in one state, these will be held close together, and then if you drag the ring away, you'll pull these bits apart and you'll switch off uh, whatever interaction that, they were, uh, that you designed in for them to have. And then you'll be changing the property effects of the molecule by controlled molecular motion, by machine-like action. And here's an example of the sort of thing that you can do for, uh, with this, which uh, uh, goes back to uh, Professor Holmes' uh, lecture uh, yesterday where he was uh, talking about fluorescence and showing these fantastic examples of uh, uh, fluorescent polymers. So this is a fluorescent group on the end of one of these uh, uh, molecular, very simple molecular machines, and it's fluorescent. So as Andy showed, you shine UV light on it and it gives out light of another color, this beautiful blue anthracene fluorescence. But on this ring on the thread, we have a group that can quench uh, the anthracene fluorescence, so basically stop it being able to, to uh, emit light. Uh, but it only does it when the ring is very close. So if the ring is switched so that it's close to here, we have the molecule in the off state, so you shine light on it and nothing comes out. And if you uh, uh, move the ring away, uh, you get this lovely on-off uh, optical response that you can see with your naked eye just by controlled molecular motion. And this works in polymers. So if you coat these molecular, simple molecular machines into polymers, you can write information in the polymer film, in the plastic film, that you can see with your naked eye 
that's just the result of controlled molecular motion of the ring up and down the, uh, uh, the thread. We can do other things as, uh, as well. This is a, a Teflon-like uh, group on the, the thread, and uh, the ring um, can either be switched to be away from the, uh, the Teflon group, so exposing it to the outside world, or we can move it by shining light on the molecule and causing a, a chemical change in the shape of this group here. We can call, cause this ring to move and cover up the Teflon-like group. Now, what can we do with that? Well, we can coat these, uh, these uh, molecules onto a, uh, a surface. This is a gold surface, which is just a very, very flat surface. Um, and we can put this single layer of the molecular machine molecules on the surface. And if the, if the Teflon groups, the fluorocarbon groups, are, are exposed to the outside world, then the surface will be uh, what we call hydrophobic, which is just like the Teflon coating of a, uh, of a pan. But if we shine light on the molecule, we can cause these groups to move. The Teflon groups get covered up, and the surface changes so that it's not phobic anymore. It actually likes uh, watery substances. And this is a picture of, of movies of what you can do with such materials. So this now is a, a tiny droplet of a liquid. It's not actually water. It's diadomethane because uh, uh, it, this is a very, very tiny droplet, just a microliter, so just over a millimeter wide. And so you have to have a very high boiling point uh, uh, liquid to, because it has a very surface hi uh, high surface area to volume ratio here, so it doesn't e evaporate. And this is on, uh, uh, on this gold surface, which just has a monolayer, a single layer, thick of uh, these rotaxane uh, molecules on the surface. Uh, and what we're going to do is irradiate radi light on this surface, and you can see there's a large contact angle here because the droplet doesn't like the Teflon groups. And this is a video of what happens when you do that. So we, this is the droplet on the, on, the, on the surface here, which just has a single layer thick of these uh, molecules on the surface, and we're just irradiating at this point, which is covering up then the Teflon groups in this region here. And you can see that then the droplet starts to move along this surface of molecular machines, and then even the rear end is moving. So the whole of this droplet that you can see with your naked eye is being moved by one layer thick uh, uh, of molecules, uh, of machine molecules on a surface. And you can use that to transport an object along a surface. You can, uh, if you don't have the Teflon groups, you don't see any change of the sub, uh, 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 in the droplet, no movement, so we know that this is uh, the cause of the uh, uh, effect. You can even use this to do work. So this is a one in eight slope, which is probably more than I can do on a bicycle. Uh, but if you put the droplet on this surface, you can drive the droplet uphill against the force of gravity. Remember, this is just a, a single layer thick of molecules on this, uh, on this uh, surface, and you can drive a droplet that you can see with your eye up a hill against the force of gravity by the action of light on this surface. And these things are, are, are really getting through, uh, 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 generating a lot of force. So this distance that, the pi that these little units are moving is uh, uh, about a nanometer, so a millionth of a millimeter. And so in terms of effect of scale, this is like having a load of pistons at the bottom of the CN tower uh, and them all moving just one millimeter and being able to raise an object more than twice the height of the CN tower. So it's a, uh, an enormous distance that, that, that these things are propelling the object uphill in terms of effective scale. But those things really, the things I've talked about so far, are just sort of switches. How can we make things that are a bit more like biological uh, uh, motors, such as this molecule that walks along a, a, a microtubule, it's called uh, kinesin, or this amazing molecule that we're going to see more of t uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, the ribosome? How do we make motor systems? And the, the, the answer is that, in fact, uh, chemists need to use solutions that are already known out there, but in a different branch of science, science with a nasty-sounding name of non-equilibrium statistical physics. And uh, really, what does that um, uh, mean? Well, uh, this uh, story goes back, actually, uh, uh, 150 uh, years to uh, the time that... Um, the laws of, of physics of thermodynamics had just been formulated by uh, Lord Kelvin and uh, a scientist called James Clark Maxwell in Scotland uh, and um, uh, Boltzmann in Germany had come up with uh, the, 
the theory of heat, which said that, um, in fact, gases were made of, uh, uh, of molecular structures. And it wasn't believed by lots of people, but uh, uh, people like Maxwell and, uh, and Kelvin and Boltzmann did believe, believe that. But these foundation of these laws brought up lots of paradoxes that the scientists couldn't explain. And one of these uh, uh, is sort of articulated in a, in a thought experiment, an imaginary experiment that Maxwell came up with to illustrate this sort of paradox. So Maxwell thought, uh, 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 thought of, what about if I had a box that had some gas molecules in, and the red ones are fast moving, so they're hot, and the blue ones are, are slow moving, so they're cold. And imagine that there's a barrier between these two boxes with a, a trap door. And then every time a, uh, a, a fast-moving molecule approaches from the left, some imaginary being open, recognizes that, opens the door, and lets the fast-moving molecule move from left to right. And the cold molecules, he, allow, he opens the door to allow them to move from right to left. Uh, but he doesn't allow slow-moving ones to move from left to right or fast-moving ones from right to left. In other words, this being that's been, become known as, as Maxwell's demon is able to sort the molecules by their temperature or their speed, uh, and in doing so, he could set up a temperature gradient if that was possible to do. But if this was a frictionless door uh, that the being was operating, then he would be setting up this temperature gradient without it spending, by the looks of it, any energy if the, if the door was, uh, didn't require any energy to open or, or close. And yet, if you set up a temperature gradient, uh, that's just what you have in a, in a piston or a, a, a turbine, and you can use it to actually do work. So this would be a way of making a perpetual motion machine, getting energy for nothing, uh, which Maxwell recognized couldn't be possible. It would break uh, some of the laws of thermodynamics that uh, uh, Kelvin had uh, 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 developed, but he couldn't understand why it wasn't possible. Um, and he realized that there were other sorts of demons that would also uh, cause similar sorts of problems. You didn't have to sort according to speed of movement or temperature. You could even just sort according to position and have molecules, uh, doors being opened just to let molecules through from left to right and not from right to uh, left. Uh, and if you, this sort of effect would allow a pressure gradient to be built up. And again, it looks like the demon would be expending no energy to do that, and you would create pressure, which again, you could use to drive a turbine and get energy out. So how was this um, uh, uh, possible? Well, it took um, uh, uh, the best part of 100 years for people to figure out the full uh, 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 rationale for this uh, paradox, and it's the in fact, to do with the relationship between information and energy. So the information that this being has to process to know when to open the trap door or not is more than the energy that you can ever get back from this. And this is why laptop computers always get hot. You can't get, do information processing for nothing. Uh, but from our point of view of making molecular machines, it's very interesting because what we're able to do in these sorts of systems is somehow uh, uh, the Maxwell system is able to... Uh, uh, generate directional movement of molecules, even, uh, uh, even when uh, in, in a system where they're able to uh, go back and uh, forth and undergo random motion. And so uh, this is interesting, this uh, sort of um, behavior from our point of view of learning how to make uh, motors, because if we can do this sort of thing, even if we're putting energy in, which we'll have to do not to break any laws of thermodynamics, this would be how to make a, a molecular motor. And a few years ago, we were able to demonstrate this sort of principle. So this is Maxwell's Gedanken experiment, thought experiment. And this is a molecule which uh, does exactly the same sort of thing. It's got two compartments and uh, a ring on this thread, which it corresponds to the sort of gas molecule uh, and this barrier between them. And what we want to do is to set up a system whereby this barrier opens preferentially if the ring approaches from the left. Uh, but when it's on the right, the machine somehow realizes that the ring is there and, uh, uh, and it's not allowed to go back the other way. And if we can do that, then we can actually drive the population of particles, of rings here, from the left to the right without ever changing their uh, energy. And this would be what physicists would call an information ratchet mechanism. It's, process, it's, it's a, a, a called a Brownian ratchet mechanism. It's relying on information processing. Uh, but this would be doing it in a molecular structure, in a real, real sort of thing. And so we were lucky enough with some very clever students to actually design such a system uh, that, that worked. 
And this is actually the amount of rings on one side of, the, uh, of this uh, molecule. And if we shine light on it, uh, we're actually able to drive the populations of the rings over to the other side. This is actually a barrier here and generate um, uh, uh, more of the rings on the right-hand side on the, the left. And so this then is in a molecular machine, uh, a molecular system, an information mechanism that can be used to power uh, molecular motors. So how can we uh, use that? Well, these are the sorts of molecules that we really want to be inspired uh, by. These biological systems that I hinted at before. This is kinesin, this molecule that walks down polymer threads and carries uh, uh, structures, uh, uh, from proteins from the nucleus uh, uh, out of the, uh, uh, to other parts of the nucleus. And it's a, a really complicated uh, molecular machine, but how can we mimic these sorts of, of things? Um, well, again, uh, 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 I can't emphasize this stuff that the way to do this is not to try and mimic the sort of uh, uh, motions, smooth motions that we saw before. At the molecular level, uh, uh, movements are much more random than we expect, and this is, uh, we're likely to have to make things that go backwards, forwards, take double steps, uh, and so on. And so this is much more like the way that kinesin and the sorts of molecules that we make uh, uh, really move. Um, and so the way to uh, actually make these sorts of structures then uh, is to make things uh, like this, where we have molecules which have got two feet uh, and uh, a very simple just four foot hole track. And what we need to do is to have one foot, the feet detached one at a time, this one stays detached while the other one moves and so on to allow us to move up and down the track. And if we can do that, we can get repetitive, directional, processive uh, motion. And uh, this is the actual molecule uh, we made that could uh, uh, do that. And um, it, it has feet that uh, 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 bind to different sorts of uh, 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 footholds, uh, chemically different footholds. And by playing with these chemical processes, we can actually start by having the ring on the left-hand side and make it take a step a, at a time uh, and move up and down uh, and walk along the track. However, this molecule doesn't move directionally. All it does is take steps randomly back and forward uh, along the track. And to make it move directionally, which would, uh, re requires work to be done, we have to introduce a ratchet mechanism. And in this molecule, we do that by adding this unit here, which is uh, something that changes shape when we shine light on it. And if the walker, walking group isn't over the top of it, that really doesn't uh, matter. But if it's part of a, a, of a ring with this uh, unit in and it changes shape, it puts a lot of strain energy into the walker. And you can use this strain energy to actually do some uh, uh, work. So to illustrate that, here's a uh, the sort of walker with this extensible bit. And uh, this is the one without it that's not actually directional. And I'll try and show how a ratchet mechanism makes this able to move uh, directionally. So we start off with the walker on the left-hand side, and these are all the molecules here. And uh, if we allow this one to step, this foot to step forward, uh, then what will happen is uh, half of these molecules will say uh, step forward to give you this sort of position. Uh, and then what we do is put some strain energy into the structure here. So we put this strain energy in, and this raises the energy of the molecules that are, of the walkers that are in this part. And then when the left-hand uh, left foot is allowed to move, far more uh, 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 molecules actually walk to the right than actually uh, uh, go backwards, whereas in this case, just as many go back as actually go forwards. And so that is actually, uh, uh, this is just showing that this really uh, works. And this is actually the first example of a small molecule uh, linear molecular motor. It works by this ratchet mechanism. And we can actually drive it in either direction along the, uh, the track. So does size uh, uh, matter? Uh, my wife is always telling me it does. I, I say no, no, no. Uh, this is actually kinesin. This is our, our molecule. And kinesin, this big biological walker, uh, uh, takes very large steps for a, for a molecule, eight nanometer steps, whereas ours takes much smaller steps. And this hydrolyzes a molecule of ATP every time it takes a step, whereas uh, we either shine light or switch between acid and base. 
Our molecule is already quite possessive. It takes 37 steps on average before it falls off the track, whereas wild-type kinesins typically take about 100 steps. And our molecule can even do something that kinesin can't. It can walk in either direction, depending on uh, how we program the, the, the reaction conditions, whereas biological proteins always move in one direction. But, of course, the great thing that the biological motor proteins can do is that they can carry cargo and they can move along polymers, and we can't do that uh, uh, yet. Those are the next things that we need to be able to do. But it's still amazing that something that weighs uh, 250,000 uh, Dalton, so a, a really big molecule, can be mimicked. Some of its properties, in a very, very basic form, can be mimicked by something that's just 21 uh, atoms big. Okay. What about the ultimate uh, of machines that are uh, uh, in the universe today, the ribosome? Uh, we're going to hear more about, much more about this molecule uh, 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 tomorrow from uh, uh, Venki. Uh, but uh, just to say, say now, this is the most amazing machine that there is. It's what actually makes all the proteins in, in your body. And it does it by taking messenger RNA, so information from a, uh, a strand of RNA, and, and taking tRNA building blocks and putting them together to actually form peptide chains that, are, uh, that fold up into uh, proteins. And uh, it's a really incredible uh, machine. How can we make a molecule like this that makes other molecules. This is an extraordinary molecule. It's got a molecular weight of two and a half million to four and a half uh, million. Uh, 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 so at least uh, 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 10 times bigger than kinesin, which itself is a big protein. How can we begin to mimic these sort of structures? Well, here is a, a very, very primitive uh, artificial um, uh, 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 ribosome based on a, or, 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 or based on a rotaxane architecture. So what it contains is a, a ring with this uh, reactive uh, sort of right robotic uh, arm and, the, uh, and a, a track which has got building blocks on the track which block the movement of the ring along the thread. And what happens is that the idea is that this ring is going to move along the track and it's got a catalytic arm which is going to pick off the barriers in front of it that are blocking its path and then it's going to pass those building blocks onto a, a site here where uh, the building blocks can be assembled to actually make uh, the oligomeric uh, peptide. And once this building block is detached the, uh, the, uh, and the, the building block transferred to here, uh, the arm is regenerated it can, uh, and it can move along. So this is the, uh, the chemistry that we're going to use is this is going to be the sort of catalytic group here, and this is going to be the uh, elongation uh, site. And the way this is going to work is through a process called uh, native chemical ligation, and we're going to set up a system where this happens catalytically or iteratively. Um, and uh, what's going to happen is this catalytic group is going to come along, uh, uh, detach the building block here, pass it from the catalytic site to the other site, regenerate the catalytic group, and this is then free to move along to the next building block, pick that up, transfer that then to the, uh, uh, the, the first building block, regenerate the catalytic site, go along to the final one on this very short strand, break the uh, 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 bond, uh, uh, detach this, attach it to here, and then fall off the, the, the track. And so this would be a, a synthetic molecular machine that can synthesize an oligopeptide, a very short peptide, with a specific sequence that comes from the thread. It actually works in the opposite direction to the ribosome. It synthesizes the amino acids in the, in the opposite direction. Uh, so this is actually the chemical structure, much too uh, complicated uh, 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 to go into. Uh, but just as this is how we make it, we actually take the strands, build those up, uh, the building blocks on the strands one at a time, uh, assemble the ring around uh, this so that it can't come off the track and go and interact with other molecules, which will stop the sequence. We then add the robotic arm, the catalytic arm, to the top to make the um, uh, uh, full machine and then activate it uh, uh, so that it's ready for action. And when we do that, we get a single product out uh, 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 at the end. This single product has got all the chemical groups in it that we expect, so exactly one alanine, exactly one um, leucine, one phenylalanine, two glycines, and a cysteine. And the sequence is exactly the one that we anticipated because we can look at how this molecule breaks down 
it by mass spectrometry and show that it's the, got the identical sequence to uh, the ones that we would have from the track. So uh, that is uh, uh, what we're hoping to do with that is to make longer peptide chains, turn helices, and even maybe mini proteins, do other sort of reactions that biology doesn't do, and uh, 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 eventually use this to make sort of molecular factories and molecular assembly lines. Okay, I've used up way too much of my uh, time. My uh, apologies uh, uh, for that, but I just want to uh, finish by uh, talking to you about one final um, uh, 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 sort of thing that we, we met earlier. Because when I was coming over here, uh, I was thinking that, uh, you know, chemistry, it's, it's really a lot like love. Uh, uh, you know, that there's um, a, a special someone for all of us, uh, a particular one for all of us, but sometimes almost anything will do. And uh, I wanted to um, sort of illustrate to you how much chemistry is like love. And uh, last night I was sitting next to a very lovely uh, uh, lady who I hope that she'll well, won't mind coming and helping me uh, uh, with this experiment. So, Margie, could you just come down and actually give a hand with this if you, if you, don't, if you don't mind? That would, be, that would be really kind of you. So, a uh, uh, big hand for Margie, everyone. Uh. So, th thanks, Margie. So, uh, Margie, uh, we were talking about love and romance last night. And, uh, come, come up, Margie. And, uh, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. And um, uh, Margie was telling me that she's married to the most wonderful guy who's actually uh, the person who invited... Uh, 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 the, uh, the speakers or some of the speakers over here today, it's uh, Alan, Alan Williams. And I was very surprised by your description of him because you were saying he's a wonderful man, he's lovely, he's definitely my soulmate and all these things. And those of you who have met Alan uh, might find it difficult to... to uh, 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 Alan, just stand up and show the uh, audience what a fine figure of a man uh, Alan, Alan is. So... So... Okay, thanks, thanks, Alan. So... I was really touched. That's fine. You can sit, sit, sit down there. Uh, Alan. That, that's your piece done. Uh, so I was, I was really touched by that, but, but I'm a scientist. So I like to see, you know, experimental verification of, uh, 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 of these sort of things. So I want to give Margie the chance, you know, to sort of trade up a bit, really. Uh, and so uh, we've, we, we want to try and find out who is the perfect guy uh, uh, for you, Margie. So uh, we're going to try and uh, do this, but we're going to do it sort of randomly. Uh, okay, so what about Brad Pitt? Is he your sort of... No, not, not, not so much. What about Tom? Is Tom, Tom Cruise? Absolutely not. Absolutely not? Oh, dear, dear, dear. <laughs> what about uh, George? George Clooney stayed in our hotel. I Great show. Yes. No, no, no. Oh, my own favourite, Super David Beckham, maybe? Oh. No, 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 no. Definitely not. <laughs> uh, or Mr. James, Daniel Craig, maybe? No? Oh, it's a hard man, a hard lady to, to please. Well, let, let's find out uh, who would be the, really the, the, the perfect guy for you. Let's, so what we have to do is, uh, we, we, it's a random thing because it's a scientific uh, experiment. So what you have to do is you have to go, he loves me, and you put it to the bottom, and then he loves me not, we throw it to one side. So he loves me goes to the bottom. He loves me not to the side. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. So for me, for me, it would be Super Dave, okay? But we'll see. Uh, let's see for, uh, 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 for Margie. So you have to say it as we go through. So you have to say, he loves me goes to the bottom. He loves me. He loves me not. We throw that uh, away. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me to the bottom. He loves me not. And the perfect guy is... Let's have a, oh! Hey! It, uh, uh, it is Alan after all. So we have... We have scientific verification. Well done, Margie. Thank you so much. There you go. You could keep it. You could keep, keep it. So it's true. It's true. Okay. So uh, I hope I've been able to convince you that it really is possible to uh, control molecular motion and make sort of molecular machine type, type uh, uh, systems. Where is this all going? 
Well, just as uh, 100 years ago when they had the Model T Ford, uh, I'm not sure they'd have predicted that Alan's car would look like uh, this Ferrari uh, uh, today. And in the same way, it's just been uh, sort of 10, 15 years since we made these sort of structures. Uh, and already we can make real motors and make molecules that move things um, uh, uphill. Uh, Where's it going? I don't know, but there's many good reasons to do nanotechnology, not least of which that Jessica Alba thinks that it's great. So my thanks to Jessica and also to, uh, uh, and also to uh, uh, my group for a wonderful lot from all over the world. And uh, I'll just finish you showing you uh, some pictures of Edinburgh, which I've just moved away uh, from. And this is where uh, I uh, used to live in the new town of Edinburgh, all built in Georgian times. And Great Stuart Street, and if you go down here into Ainsley Place and through into Murray Place, down here into India Street, then you come to uh, into India Street. You come to 14 India Street, and 14 India Street is the home of uh, uh, is the birthplace of James Clark Maxwell, who we met earlier. So James Clark Maxwell was one of the three greatest scientists of all time, along with uh, Newton and Einstein. Uh, uh, not because of Maxwell demon, but because uh, it was Maxwell who discovered that light uh, was really uh, mag electromagnetic uh, radiation. And that's an achievement of which Richard Feynman, the famous Nobel laureate uh, of physics, said 10,000 years from now, there can be little doubt that the most significant event of the 19th century will be judged as Maxwell's discovery of the laws of electrodynamics. And that's an astonishing thing to say, that the most important thing that happened in an entire century wasn't what a politician did, wasn't what a soldier did, wasn't what a president did or a general. It was what a scientist did and what a scientist thought. And you could say the same true for the, uh, uh, for the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, 17th century, the 18th century, the 20th century. And it was great seeing so many uh, young people, school kids from the Geneva area yesterday, because with them, I think that the 21st century is in great hands uh, uh, as well. So thanks very much. Uh, 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 for having me here, and I'll leave you with one final thought that sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Thank you. I'm extremely glad that your experimental proof showed that my wife was right. This is <laughs> uh, and uh, so we now have time for discussion and questions. So if you have questions, please write them on the cards that have been distributed. I would remind you that you're welcome to ask general questions on science. If that we have, we've had a lot of questions the past few days, so please don't be disappointed if we cannot answer all the questions, but uh, if you wish to leave, then please leave quietly and quickly now, otherwise we will carry on with the discussion. Well, I think we can begin. Um, we'll make a very bad start to begin with because of the question directed to Dr. Roderick McKinnon. Who should be landing in New York at this moment? So, uh, but I think the question that he asked can easily be addressed by the members of the panel. Practitioners of alternative therapies often refer to subtle energy fields around human bodies. Anybody got a comment on that? Thank you. Well. I think that I'm uh, a big advocate of evidence-based medicine. And by that I mean the uh, current methodology for judging whether a treatment is effective or not uh, has to do with randomized clinical trials, okay? Blind randomized cl clinical trials. Now, why do we need blind randomized clinical trials. The reason is that the interaction between our brain and our emotions and the rest of our body is highly intricate and very complex. 
there are cases where uh, of the placebo effect, where the power of suggestion has affected a cure that are absolutely remarkable, okay? For instance, uh, people have done a knee surgery on, some, uh, uh, on, on two groups of patients. In one case, uh, they did a fake surgery. That is to say, they uh, went through the entire motion, they anesthetized the patient, etc., but they didn't actually do the knee surgery, okay? And the, the patient, you know, then woke up, etc. And in the other case, they did the knee surgery. And uh, it, it turned out that a remarkable number of the people on whom the fake surgery had been done actually showed an improvement, you know, in their knees, okay? Now, this just shows you how powerful uh, our brains are in terms of suggestion, okay? And so, if you look at all these alternative therapies, nearly all of them rely on that, okay? Now, you might ask, well, what's wrong with that? Why not, you know, use the power of suggestion? Well, it's okay if both the patient and the doctor are aware of what's going on, okay? And if they consent to it, that's one thing. The other problem is that we don't know how to harness this power of suggestion in an effective way, okay? It's, it's highly erratic, it's highly reproducible, and it's highly variable from one patient to another. So it's not a, uh, a standard protocol for treating anything. And that's why when we talk about medicines, about modern medicines, they all have to face a test. That is, is it due to the medicine, or is it due to the doctor telling you, here, take this, you know, blue pill, and you'll be fine, okay? And it might just be sugar, okay? So that's the uh, objection I have uh, to alternative therapy, which is that there's no control, and it's simply relying on the power of uh, placebo. And, uh, and that's why modern medicine is very, very rigorous and very careful uh, to do randomized clinical trials. Now, uh, we have a question. Um, somebody says, well, since uh, associated with all movement is an energy, and since energy involves a loss of mass, is the mass of molecules going towards zero with time? Uh, uh, no. Uh, so the... Um, the molecules uh, move, the components of the molecules uh, uh, move, so everything is moving at the molecular level, but that's not consuming uh, any energy uh, at all. So it's not the same as um, causing movements in the uh, macro, in the big world that we live in. So if I, uh, in order to knock this bottle of water over, I have to hit it and give it some energy to uh, uh, fall over, and that energy then conver is converted to heat, which would be uh, dispersed. But at the at the molecular level, uh, everything that has a uh, uh, that has a temperature, so everything warmer than absolute zero, which is only found in the outer regions of of, of space, uh, is actually uh, moving anyway, and th 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 that movement doesn't consume any energy at all. So uh, that that movement of molecules doesn't cause heat to, uh, 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 to, uh, to dissipate. Okay. Uh, question here, what are the chance of creating machines to make liquid fuels out of solar energy? Uh, uh, and water and... Yeah, so, uh, well, I really believe in um, uh, the future of, of molecular machines, not necessarily the work... Uh, uh, that, uh, that we do, but the, the generations that will come after us, simply because bio biology uses uh, molecular machines for everything, to power every aspect of, uh, of life. Uh, uh, all, all aspects of life depend fundamentally upon molecular machines, and biology isn't using molecular machines for no good reason. And when we're able to uh, make molecular machines uh, and understand how to really control motion and get the components to interact in the way that we want, we'll really be able to do amazing things such as 
uh, uh, harvest energy from the sun more efficiently, I'm sure, and also make, use molecules to actually make molecules uh, which could be fuel molecules. So I, I, I really believe that those are uh, uh, possibilities in the future. Another question. Uh, you've, you're a chemist. You ended your talk talking about a, a physicist, and your examples were biological. So, and this is, concerns everybody. For science education, should we really have the separation of the three subjects? Difficult, a difficult one. So, uh, but I think that um, uh, we've, we've al already heard this week uh, uh, about how broad science is becoming and how interdisciplinary you have to be in order to tackle the big problems of today. And uh, a, a lot of our work is inspired by understanding how biological machines work. And other parts of our work are uh, based on understanding of what physicists have known for a long time and translating that into chemical terms that chemists didn't understand that those things were known in other disciplines. But I actually believe it, you, it, you need to have firm foundations in uh, uh, the underpinning disciplines. So I don't think that it's wrong to learn chemistry as chemistry and biology and bio as biology and physics as physics and maths as, uh, as, as maths, because uh, these give you, um, uh, these are uh, useful frameworks in w uh, of which to transfer uh, 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 knowledge. And it's uh, then once you, uh, once you uh, have these building blocks to, uh, of knowledge to build on, then you can start understanding how to move between uh, the others. It may be that it, it you, can, you can do just as well by having um, broader, uh, 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 learning through broader themes, but I think it, it, this compartmentalization of things at, at an early stage is actually quite useful, that's my, my view. What do, I, do other members of the panel? Come yeah, I, I think, you know, a, a simple analogy is if you take this auditorium or this building, uh, it has a, uh, physical structure, you know, the masonry and the uh, beams that hold it up, etc., which are the role of a civil engineer. It has an electrical system which a civil engineer may not be very familiar with and which has its own technical problems and its own training that's required to install it. And it has plumbing, I'm sure, uh, uh, which uh, again requires a uh, highly specialized uh, knowledge and highly specialized tools. So uh, now it doesn't mean that they don't talk to each other when they construct this building. And so I think, um, you know, David's absolutely right. Uh, each, in, each discipline has its own language and its own knowledge and rigor. And you need to learn that before you can then uh, cross talk with other disciplines to create something uh, that's bigger than just the discipline alone. be the ideal designed molecular machine? The ideal design of a molecular machine? The ideal designed molecular machine. What, what would the new machine that you would like to make, shall we say? Um, uh, uh, another uh, very good question. So uh, uh, the, the ones that uh, I, I talked to, really understanding what it's going to be possible to do, uh, to make with synthetic molecular machines. It's a bit like um, you, you saw how primitive the examples were that I, uh, I was giving, and some of those are as sophisticated as ever anyone's ever made in, uh, uh, in, in terms of synthetic m machines. And you can see how, how really simple uh, uh, they are. And so it's a bit like asking Stone Age man, just after he's made the wheel, to predict motorways and cities and, uh, 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 and so on. Uh, but... Uh, um, uh, and you, you, there's no point trying to make something that's too complicated uh, uh, yet. You can have visions that it would be wonderful to be able to make molecules uh, uh, that could self-replicate and that, uh, or that could harvest energy uh, uh, from the sun and do it better than you can do with non-molecular machine systems yet. But I think at this stage we don't know uh, enough about how to make the molecules interact with each other in the way that we want in order to design, design those sort of things. So we try and take medium-sized steps we, we, uh, and s s uh, 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 in order to get where, where we're going. I think we've taken the first baby steps, 
uh, uh, but it's still very early days for uh, uh, for a field. But I, I'm sure that uh, uh, in 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 my lifetime we're going to see some really exciting uh, developments, not in the next five years, but in the next ten and fifteen years. Well, I, I was just wondering how far away you think we are from self-replicating machines, and especially ones that can mutate. Yeah, so I think that uh, for, for uh, if those are uh, machines that are made out of uh, uh, RNA or, um, uh, uh, or, or even uh, uh, proteins that, that might be, or, or peptides, that might be possible to make uh, even with today's understanding of how things uh, 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 work. Um, so those sort of things I don't think uh, will be too far away. I don't think it will be uh, so far away where we make uh, real self-replicating molecules that people uh, can say uh, are really uh, have many of the characteristics of life. So artificial life, I, I don't think that that is far away at all. It wouldn't uh, uh, surprise me at all to open science tomorrow and see Craig Venter had, uh, 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 had done it. So those sorts of things could, could happen tomorrow or they could be in five years or they could be in 10 years, but I don't think they're going to be longer than that. That uh, raises the question, somebody talks the famous phrase, science sans conscience, uh, science without conscience, as it's in English. What about the self, people obviously are rather frightened about self uh, replicating molecules and afraid they'll sort of fill up the room. And yes, but um, uh, so again, um, so in science, it's, it's very difficult to say that things are, uh, to say things are impossible, unless they break uh, uh, laws of physics, and probably they need to break two or more laws of physics for you to be sure that they're going to be uh, uh, impossible. But there's different levels of, of, uh, uh, of science fiction. So for example, life on other planets is something that is science fiction because we don't know that it's there, but it's actually something that uh, many, many scientists uh, are pretty sure uh, is, is likely to uh, uh, exist. Whereas something like time travel, uh, that uh, it would be something that would be extremely unlikely to uh, 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 exist, most scientists uh, uh, would think. So what is it, what about self-replicating uh, uh, machines? Are they going to uh, make grey goo that can overtake the, the planet? I don't see how, I think that that's at the same sort of extreme as time travel, uh, because these things are going to have to consume a fuel. Nothing can replicate uh, without uh, consuming a, 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 a fuel. And um, uh, uh, biology isn't able to make uh, uh, creatures that can consume anything, and it seems uh, uh, very unlikely that we're going to be able to design anything, either by accident or through design that would also be able to, uh, 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 to do that. Uh, and so I think that the chances of those things happening are so infinitesimally small that you're just as likely to find someone coming back from the future and telling you that it hasn't happened. We have a social question. Are you connected scientifically to Fraser Stoddart? Uh, I am indeed. <laughs> I am his, uh, uh, I have his uh, uh, child, not by... Uh, uh, not through genes, but through uh, him being my PhD supervisor. So, yeah. <laughs> Where is memory located in nanomolecule machines, or is memory the wrong notion? Yes, I'm not sure what that. Um, what <laughs> no, why I, I read it. Uh, Where's memory located in in uh, in, in nano machines? Uh, I th the structures the the molecules don't have um, uh, any uh, uh, memory. They uh, they exist as a, as a function of state, so if you make them in one sort of shape, they will, uh, 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 with the components in one position, they'll stay in that position until you move them to uh, something else, and then they won't remember where they were before. It's the same as if you just, it, it, it doesn't remember the route of how it, how it got there. And uh, I think the last question, uh, I don't understand either. Um, Lavoisier tells us that um, nothing is created, nor nothing is lost, everything transforms. M molecular machines, uh, are they involved in this sort of 
this state of affairs? Well, uh, from the point of view uh, that, I, uh, as I was saying, even we were talking about making molecules that can build other molecules, and I gave the uh, uh, example of the first sort of molecules that we're, we're doing of being able to construct short peptides, but they have to use building blocks. They're not creating the peptides from nothing. They're using uh, uh, building blocks that are uh, attached to a track, and those building blocks have to be attached to the track in order to be used as a uh, as a fuel. So these, uh, 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 no molecular machines will ever be able to create matter that wasn't uh, uh, there before. It's it's using the atoms that were in uh, a, a fuel substrate and converting that into something else. Just like when you m bake a cake, you take eggs and flour and sugar and those ingredients are converted into the uh, cake. The cake is never going to weigh more than the uh, ingredients that went into it. And it's exactly the same on making molecules. Okay, well, I think we've answered all the questions. You've seen the beginnings of what could be a very exciting field, and I'd like you to join me in thanking David once again. Thank you.